All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. This is Coffee Talk, and uh, today's uh, class was a sponsor, Lili Nishmat Nisim Ben Meir, and also sponsor Lili Nishmat Matilda Bat Polisa and Joseph Bat Matilda by the Nechmat family. Um, we've spoken about this idea of free will, and um, free will isn't a easy concept to understand, especially in the uh, age of uh, psychology and science. And the reason why it's so complicated is because today many scientists will tell you that we have no free will. And this was the conversation that we had last week. Last week's conversation was about you know, the nature of free will and the uh, philosophical ramifications of buying into the psychological interpretation of free will, which is there is no free will. And therefore, based on psychology and science today, you are who you are. There is no other expression of your own identity. Um, you're born with a certain set of um, predetermined traits, and you're stuck. You can never change. You can never be more. You can never be less. And obviously, the problem with that is that if we actually believe that you are born with a predisposition of a certain kind of behavior and it can never change, then um, you'll end up with a philosophical issue. How can you punish someone for doing something they can't control? How do you put people in jail if they have no choice but to steal? They have no choice but to lie? And the answer is you can. Society would completely break down and fall apart. So last week we dealt with the philosophical idea of free will, how it works. And this week, what we were going to try to do is try to understand the ramifications of the idea, meaning like, okay, so I got it. I understand why it's important to have free will. I understand how uh, free will is an essential part of Jewish thinking and Jewish life. But now let's talk about it practically, Rabbi. If we believe there's something called free will, how can that possibly work if we believe there's a God that is omniscient, right? He's omnipotent. Um, there's something called divine provin providence. How do we have a world where we actually, where our choices matter in light of this infinite awesomeness? How is there room for me to be me and express myself in a world where there's this infinite being that literally uh, is aware of every single step of the way? And that's, that's going to be the theme for today. That's what I want to try to address today. And the way in which I'm, I try to prepare my classes is where I don't do as much speaking because I hate talking. Uh, but I try to give you the sources so that it's not me teaching it to you, but it's actually you learning it for yourselves. Because ultimately, I really believe that education is you having the power to internalize ideas for yourselves, not just me sharing it with you. Yeah. And therefore, the more you're able to participate, the more profound I believe the ideas will resonate within you, because that's what I want. I, wanna, I want these ideas to be your ideas, not my ideas. And the beautiful thing is that they're not my ideas, because they're, our, they're ideas that have been handed down to us from generations. These are ideas you'll see, like you know, from the sources. This conversation is an old conversation. It's the conversations the rabbis had in the Talmud. It's a conversation that Joseph had with his brothers. It's a conversation that rabbis have had for the last 2,000 years in Galut. So we're going to see how different people dealt with different questions at different times. And at any point, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to uh, ask. There's no interruptions here. This is a conversation. This is why I called it coffee talk. I wanted it to be like a casual. If I could have uh, filled the room with couches and coffee tables, I would have. Uh, but this is the best that we can do. So uh, forgive me. Okay, so uh, let's start at uh, source number one. We'll start with a Gemara in Chulin. Gemara over there says there's actually extra source sheets over here, and there's some sc scattered around. You're welcome. Gemara says as follows Rabbi, Chana Rabbi Chananya said, a person does not even bang his finger below in this world without it being decreed above, as it is written, from God are the steps of man. So what does that mean, practically? If pre everything's preordained. So if everything is preordained, then where is there room for my free will? Right? I, I don't know. Rabbi, you just told me that we have free will, we have choice. But you just quoted a piece of Talmud that says the exact opposite is true. So let's see how let's let's see this let's see this play out in another way. We have this for this is going to come up in a couple of weeks. This in source number two is the story of Yosef and the brothers. Joseph is we know sold into slavery by his brothers. They are jealous of him, and uh, this um, these per, these psukim over here deal with Yosef literally revealing himself and him dealing with his brother his his, his brother's concerns of, of taking revenge. So listen to what he says. Right? And Joseph says to his brothers, come forward to me. 
right? Geshuna Eli. And when they came forward, he told them, I am your brother Yosef, he whom you sold to Egypt. Now, do not be distressed or reproach yourselves because you have sold me hither. It was to save life that God had sent me ahead of you. Period. What is he saying over there? He's saying, you guys think that you sold me into slavery and that was the result of your poor choices, your poor decision making. He's saying, no, God sent me here in advance to save lives, right? It is now two years there has been famine in the land and there are still five years to come in which there shall be no yield from tilling. Right? There's not going to be any produce in the earth. God has sent me ahead of you to ensure your survival on earth and to save your lives in the extraordinary deliverance. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Paro, lord of his, all of his household and ruler of the whole land of Egypt. So what is, this is a verse in the Torah. This is not just a rabbi, you know, telling you his opinion. We're talking about a prime source, a biblical source, that everything is somewhat preordained. So if, in fact, everything is preordained, like Yosef is saying over here, should the brothers have been punished for um, selling Yosef? Why? No, the answer should be, they should not be punished. They should not be punished. <coughs> There's another one right there also. <coughs> it's true. They they didn't they, they, they but but according to what he's saying over here, they should not be punished. He's saying, listen, you guys, you had no choice. God saw the future. He saw there was gonna be a problem with you know uh, famine. I came here in advance to take care of this issue. Don't worry about it. You're okay. Chalas. Move on and uh, yalla, you know, let's uh, forget the past. And according to his logic, you would assume they should not be punished. They should not be punished. <coughs> because. <coughs> right. Yes, they were jealous of him. So you could say, so what Maria is saying, at the very least, they should be punished for the jealousy. So, okay, he's not addressing the jealousy part. He's just dealing with the fact that they actually sold their brother into slavery. <laughs> and that that action itself had positive ramifications. <coughs> now, should the, were the brothers held accountable for their actions? They are. They are held accountable. As, as a matter of fact, there's a concept called Asure Malga, that every generation in history has 10 martyrs who end up dying for the sins of the Shvatim, right? And therefore, if they are punished, there are two ways of dealing with that consequence. Either one, God is a masochist, that he loves creating a reality where you're going to mess up and you have no choice, no control, and therefore you're going to get punished anyway because he likes you when you're in pain, which I reject. Or there's something else that's missing in our understanding, interpretation of this kind of hashgacha providence from God. You, hear, you, hear, you, hear, you understand? Like if you're in the camp that uh, says that no, they should not be punished, if they should be punished, right, then you're basically saying that, well, they had no free will, they had no choice, and therefore God likes them, that God wants them to be punished. I have a hard time accepting that as far as a definition of God. I think of God as being all loving, all, all knowing, to create things for suffering it doesn't make any sense. Suffering, we as Jews see it as a way of development of growth, not as a way of just punishment for the sake of punishment. But still, even if we take it the other way, which is that no, that they actually had a choice, Yosef is not saying that. So how do we reconcile the idea that it, they, were, they still had choice, but somehow they were doing something that um, was going to happen regardless of their choice? Now, in this story of Yosef, could there have been another scenario where Yosef ends up in Mitzrayim yes. as the viceroy? Without going to jail, without suffering. So. Right, there could have been lots of choices that happened. There could have been lots of things that had happened. But he's saying, listen, now at the end of it, we're looking at hindsight, everything that happened is from God. Yes. Yosef. Okay. I agree with you, yes, so. So that's why Hashem wanted him to go through all this in order for him to be a tzaddik. Okay, that's a separate question. You're, it's true, meaning like his journey yeah. and the challenges helped him get to become the he person he I is. But the question that we're dealing with over here is, are the brothers, Hashemim, are they at fault?
for selling him and having him go through that process. No, because it's from Hashem. Okay, so, okay, so number one is you're saying no, it's from Hashem, but I'm going to respectfully disagree and say that they didn't have to be the shliach. But yeah. that's what Hashem the, 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 They didn't have to be the messenger. I'll give you another example of this. But Ready? This one second. Ready? We know from Abraham that, that the Jewish people were going to be slaves to a stranger in a slave land, in a, in a strange land. Right? That Am Yisrael were going to go down at some point, they're going to be slaves to somebody. We find out later, right, about 300, 250 years later, that it's going to be in Egypt to Paro and Mitzrayim. Why were the Mitzrayim punished for doing what God wanted? Why were they, why were they so um, 10 plagues, the uh, Yamsuf, all the things that happened in Mitzrayim, why are, we, why are we celebrating the punishment if they're just carrying out Ratzon Hashem, they're carrying out the will of God? Do you hear the question? It should bother you a little bit. Yeah. Like, why is that? Why is that okay? Like, we shouldn't be. As a matter of fact, you know, when, when the Midrash says it, when the when the bodies of the Egyptians were washed ashore, and and the uh, the Jewish people were like stunned to see their 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 taskmasters dead, the Malachim started dancing, and Hashem says to the Malachim, "Stop dancing. There's no reason to celebrate this kind of destruction. This is a this is a terrible thing. These are also my children." So how do we reconcile this idea that, that these people were carrying out God's will and yet they suffered so much for, for doing it? Why were they punished? Could you punish your child for, for, uh, for doing what you want them to do? How is that a punishment? What kind of sick person are you? Oh, okay. So Robin's giving you the answer of the Midrash. Okay, Robin is saying that really who says how much they have to be enslaved? That's true, they were supposed to be prisoners, but the Mitzrayim went too far, and therefore the fact that they went overboard, that's why they were punished. But I'm going to say something more than that. Who said they had to take the role of being master to the enslaved? You mean the Egyptians? Yeah. Who said? Who said they had to take that role? If we know that these people have to be punished, what would have happened if Egypt said, we're not doing it, God, we don't want to do it? What if everyone said no to God? If we believe we have free will, then don't we believe that we have the power to say no to God? Yes, we do. If that's if, we do. Think about what you're saying. If we don't have the power, then we don't have free will. And if we don't have free will, then how are we punished? Do you hear, the, do you hear, do you hear it? Think of it like this. If, if I created a robot, and the robot did exactly what I tell it to do, okay, and the, the robot goes ahead and it steals something, can we punish the robot for stealing? No. Why? Okay, same thing over here. If you have no free will, because you're programmed by God, then there's no way I should be able to punish you for anything. But we see people being punished. So there's two ways of understanding it. Either God likes you to see people in pain, which I, just, I reject, or there is some kind of free will we're just not fully understanding. Right? Yes, that could be. And then he knows the outcome that you chose. It's not like he, he set up the outcome for you. You chose the outcome, but he does know you were going to choose. Brilliant. See, this, you guys are scholars. <laughs> scholars. <laughs> scholars. But, but we're clarifying it, right? That's the point of this conversation. All right, can someone read number three for me? How many years yeah. we were slaves in Egypt? There's a machloket. It's, there's two opinions. One says that we were there for 200 and 10 years, and another one says that we were there for 400 years. But if we do the calculations, the mathematics, it makes more sense 210 years. The slavery was supposed to be for 400 years, but the reason why it was lessened is because the Egyptians went overboard on the amount of suffering and bitterness they went through. So they experienced 400 years of pain in 210 years. But why did God give us 210 years of slavery? It's the same reason why you had homework for the first 18 years of your life. <laughs> The same reason why you got homework for the first 18 years of your life. The reason why we, we saw, we saw there's, 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 it's a great question. I asked that question on Pesach. And the question I say is, why are we thanking Hashem for freeing us from being slaves when He's the one that put us into slavery to begin with? It's a, it's a good question, right? Yeah, very good question. I know. The answer in a nutshell, and it's not a fair, it's not fair, like we'll do this before Pesach, but the answer to that question in a nutshell is that God wanted us to understand what it means to be an Eved. To be in heaven. 
an eved, a slave, a servant, what it means to be in servitude. Now, is it better to have freedom to do whatever you want or to have direction and commitment to something? Right, it's always better to have direction and commitment because we know that actually leads to something productive at the end of it, but we all want to have the freedom to do whatever we want. But we also understand that in that space of doing whatever I want, there's a danger of doing absolutely nothing. Right? Yeah. So we all agree that we need to have direction and focus and purpose and meaning, but in order to have direction, focus, meaning, and purpose, you need to have commitment. You have to put in the hard work to becoming that person that is going to overcome the challenges of that day so they could evolve into something more. Okay, someone read number three for me. Sefer HaChinuch, Mitzvah 241. Not all at once. Go ahead. Okay, so how do we reconcile that? So he's saying the same idea, like meaning like you, someone goes ahead and by accident crashes into your car. And you're like, you're an idiot. Why were you looking at your phone when you did that? Right? And there's all that damage that happened. And you're so frustrated. Right? So what, the, what we just read was that no, you were supposed to have some kind of damage. And the person that crashed into you was the unfortunate messenger of that damage. Now, why was that person the messenger? because of their own actions. So what does God do? He aligns things so that the right people end up bumping into the right people at the right times, for good and for bad. And therefore, when you're going ahead and you find yourself in a circumstance which is challenging and difficult and frustrating, right? you have two ways of looking at it. Either this person is a whatever, whatever adjective you want to use to describe them, right? or this person was sent there to teach you a certain kind of lesson. Be- well, 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 why are you dealing? Why, why are you? Why is this person? Why that person crash into you? Why is it to you and not to the person next door to you? Why is on some level that that there, everything that is challenging that happens for us? Remember, sins are not just you know uh, punishments are not just random you know God throwing you know uh, lightning at you and, and zapping you for your sins. God does what He does so that you can grow and become something more from the circumstances that you're in. You could just be frustrated. 100%. So you could see the car accident, you know, God forbid, as a way of, oh, this is so idiot, this guy was stupid, he crashed into me, and, and miss the whole point of that, you know what, maybe I'm, I, uh, God sent me this car accident to be more mindful of X, Y, or Z. Maybe I need to spend more time being careful, or maybe the car accident was a way of protecting you for something worse down the line. Because that's what Yosef is saying. Yosef is saying earlier that, guys, don't worry about it. I, I, I've reconciled all of the pain of the past. I've reconciled the challenge that you put me through. How did I reconcile? Because God brought me here for a greater good. I came to save the world from famine. That's why I went through the things I went through. And I'm standing here as the most powerful man in Egypt and have the power to influence the future moving forward because of my ability to see the details that were written on the wall and save the world from hunger. That's Yosef's response. Now, we have another pasuk. Look at number four for a minute. This is in, it's in Shemot. It says, Make ish. So he who fatally strikes a man shall be put to death. If he did not do it by design, but it came about by an act of God, I will assign you a place in which he can flee. We're talking about Ire Miklad, right? Which is a, this is a basic uh, scenario where someone kills someone by accident. If you kill someone by accident, you can go ahead and flee, you have a place to hide where you're protected and so on and so forth. Look what Rashi says. Rashi is a commentator, ca- commentator. he's explaining these psukim, he's explaining these verses. He says, what case is this pasuk referring to? So there are two men, one had previously killed a person accidentally and the second had murdered. Both incidents lacked witnesses and therefore justice was not achieved by capital punishment or exile. So God arranged that these two men would meet in an inn the murderer was sitting at the bottom of the ladder. The man who had previously killed unintentionally climbed up the ladder and accidentally fell on the murderer and killed himself. And sorry, and killed him. 
There were witnesses who testified in court that he killed unintentionally, resulting in his exile. So we see that justice was achieved at the end. The man who initially had killed unintentionally was sentenced to exile. The murderer actually was killed. So from our perspective, we don't have all the pieces. We don't see how God aligns everything for us. We only see a snippet. We only see a little bit. By the way, we see this so profound in, the, in, in this week's parasha. Ready? This drives me crazy. Leah has six children. And she's pregnant now with her seventh. And what does she do? She does a cheshbon. She does her own inner work. And she says, you know what? I made a calculation. If I give birth to a seventh child, that means Rachel will only have one child. Why? Because she already knew there were going to be 12 shvatim. Each one of the shivchaot, each one of the maidservants had two children. Rachel had one child, and she already had six, and she's pregnant with number seven. So she does an internal like, you know, like calculation and says, I don't want my sister Rachel to have less children than the maidservants. So if I'm pregnant right now, I'm praying to God that this baby should be a baby girl. She calls her Dina, right? Of course, now, that's amazing. She sacrifices a Shevet. She probably was going to have, a, she had six boys, probably going to have a seventh boy at this point, right? So she does this inner work, and she says, you know what, God, I, I can't take away from my sister. I feel bad for her. She should have, she should have a, a child. I'm going to have a girl. What happens in, in this week's parasha? Dina, v'tetze Dina. Dina goes out. She goes into the world of Shechem, and some, you know, unsavory man named Shechem ben Chamor comes over to her and he likes her, she thinks she's very attractive and he takes her and he abducts her and he rapes her. Let's stop the story right there. Is there justice? How would Le'af feel? She knew that she could have another Shevet. She sacrifices having a Shevet, sacrifices having a tribe, one of the, another one of the tribes, has Dina, and how is Dina repaid? She's raped. Where's the justice? Injustice. So this is where most people get stuck. Rabbi, it's not true. How do you believe in this stuff? God is vengeful. He's mean. What's that? It doesn't matter if it was her actions or not. Something happened. I'm not blaming her. I'm not blaming Dina at all. I don't think Dina, we, can, we can't blame Dina. But the bottom line is, is that here's a girl who was, who was ultimately exiled from her family almost. You know, like because of this, this, whole, this, this caused a little mini war with Shimon and Levi killed out the whole entire city of Shechem. Yaakov was freaking out that his two sons had just committed like genocide of a small community because, because this girl was raped. But, but if we, we know the inner thinking of Le'av in the story. So how is there justice? It's cruel. It's unfair. But it's only cruel and unfair if we watch the story and stop. Right? You ever watch a movie with someone and the whole time they keep asking you questions and it's really annoying? Like, just like, watch the movie, let's see what happens. Like, like let the story go unfold. Like, don't worry about it, it'll all come together. Right? So that's all of us on some level. We're all guilty of that. Yeah. Right? So how does the story end? Now, we know that Dina actually has a child from that unfortunate uh, situation. Her name was? Osnat. Osnat. Right? Now, Osnat was sent away. Right? Where was she sent to? In Egypt, and Osnat is sent to Egypt, and she is uh, she's raised in Egypt, and she ends up marrying someone. You know who she ends up marrying? She ends up marrying Yosef. Osnat ends up marrying Yosef. Yosef marries Dina's daughter. His cousin. His cousin. Yeah, but back then they were marrying sisters. It was okay to marry cousins. Okay, so. so she was Jewish. Well, she was Jewish. It's true, but it goes by the mother, right? But even, tr- even though it's true, it went back then. So how did he know who she was? She had a locket that Yaakov gave her. Yosef recognized it and saw that she was from the house of Yaakov. So he ends up marrying her. Now, how many children do Yosef, do, does, does uh, Yosef have? Two. What are their names? <clears throat> and Menashe. What's the name of the last parsha in Bereshit? Parshat Va... Yechi. In that parsha, the last, at the end of the story, end of the book of Genesis, right? Yaakov is on his deathbed. And he calls over all the Shvatim and he gives them all brachot. He calls in Ephraim and Menashe and he gives them a bracha. What does he say to them? Ephraim uku Menashe ke Ruven and Shimon. Do Ephraim and Menashe have their own Shevet in Israel? Do they have their own portion of the land of Israel? Yes. They do? 
It's, uh, well, well uh, Ephraim was in, right, near, uh, right near Jerusalem and, uh, and not too far from Jerusalem. So they have their own portion in the land. That, uh, so, this, that, so that's my point. Dina, from her perspective, is a horrible, horrible deal. I went ahead, I sacrificed my daughter, I lost the Shevet, and now I have a daughter who's raped. But what ends up happening, the story continues. Yeah. Yosef ends up marrying the daughter and ends up having two children that are Ke'ilu, Ruven, and Shimon. So she thinks, she felt like she lost one, and what did she get back in response? Two. two. But we don't see it in real time. We don't see how everything plays itself out. We're just stuck in where we are right now. It takes time. It yeah. takes time. That's a pasuk. It's a pasuk. Yeah. To have Dante. Yeah, Dina. That's where, that's where the name Dina comes from. The way Dina. It's right there. I'll show it to you. Yeah. You have thirty days from the time of uh, of conception for it to be. How does she know she's pregnant? She knew she was pregnant. Before? I don't know how people know they're pregnant. <laughs> I don't. I can only tell you what my wife tells me. <laughs> I. No, 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 no. The sex is not determined. Within 40 days, you have, you have 40 days. Yeah. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, you can pray for the first 40 days when you know that you're pregnant. You have 40 days to, pr- to pray for the gender of the child. After that, you can't pray anymore for the gender of the child. But when you know you're pregnant, it's already, it's already a month after. Not, not necessarily true. If you're, if, you're, if you're actually calculating, if you're calculating your cycle, right? No, but think about it. No, it's not. From the time you get your period until you're actually able to ovulate, it's about almost 13, 12 to 14 days, which means by the time you should be getting your, your period is about two weeks later. Yeah. So it's only two weeks in at the, at the most of when you think you might be pregnant because you know you missed your period. So maximum, let's say 14 to 18 days. You still have another three weeks, four weeks to, three to pray. Weeks. <laughs> how much time? How many, you got to throw it in there. You got to figure out your scheduling, you know. But you have time. You can figure it out. All right. Anyway, let's go on. Yeah. Sure. Please. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Correct. No, so, so I hear you're saying, we're going to get to it. That's a great question. We're going to get to it. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to answer that. We're going to definitely get to that. Okay, good. Okay, good. So let's, let's keep going over here. So Tamil Bavli, Shabbat, says, goodness is brought about through worthy people and evil through unworthy people. What's he saying? What is the Gemara saying? Goodness is brought through, about through worthy people and evil through unworthy people. Yeah. Okay, he's saying there is free will, but he's, but he's saying more than that. Yes, he's saying there's free will, but he's saying more than that. He's not saying predetermined over here. He's saying the choices that you make, that what you do matters. And therefore, you're, if you're good, then you're bringing good. You're bad, you're bringing bad. That's what he's saying. Okay? So now, someone read number seven for me. Rav Chaim Freelander. Go ahead. You want to read it, Robin? Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Choices. It's, 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 there's, there's a, God has a vision 
for the world that he's trying to direct things to, right? So it's true, it was determined, it was predetermined that the Jewish people were going to be slaves to Parot and Mitzrayim. Okay, it's true. Again, did the Mitzrayim have to um, double down on the servitude? Did they have to make it so bitter? Could the world have chosen to not follow God's will? And I'm going to argue, yes, that ultimately evil is an expression of God's, of man's choices, not God's will. And therefore, as humanity, if we choose to say we don't want to be involved in the plan of being the, um, the, the carrier of your, this evil act because we only want to bring good into the world, that will become our reality. But we're not there yet. So God has to arrange things so that there's something called justice in the world. Because justice, if there's no justice, the whole system, everything we talk about, doesn't, is meaningless. Tzedek, Tzedek, Tirdof, the reason why Moshe said it like that is not because he stuttered. It's because he was emphasizing the idea that justice is a primary um, a foundational principle of, of Judaism. We believe that everything good that you do, will, you'll be rewarded for it. And God forbid all the bad choices you make, you will be reminded of it. <laughs> right? You can't escape it. Now, I can change it by becoming a greater person, by growing from it, by choosing not to make those mistakes anymore, by having a greater vision for the future, by you know, um, talking about you know, recognizing my own potential and then figuring out a way of actualizing my potential because that's what it is. God doesn't want to punish you because he enjoys the punishment. God wants you to get to a place where you're able to express the best version of you. And that's what life is. Every moment of life is a unique opportunity for you to choose between EA being the better version of yourself or, God forbid, being the weaker, lesser version of yourself. Now, if you're always choosing the lesser version of yourself, sometimes you're going to have to go through circumstances that are going to be very challenging and un uncomfortable and unfortunate. Now, you could avoid those things by choosing to be something more. Choosing to grow versus the circumstance forcing you to grow. How many times have you seen people you know, come out of horrible accidents where the, uh, or some kind of tragedy that forced them to rethink their lives and they've completely changed the paths that we're on as a result of this difficult circumstance? They could have, I'm not saying that the accident would not have happened, but all I'm saying is that if we can choose to become bigger, those negative things don't have to happen around us. And that's what it means if you choose good, you bring good, that creates good. We say, like, you know, we say, uh, you ever hear the expression, tiskeh the mitzvot, right? You, you uh, tisku the mitzvot, right? Tisku the mitzvot, as they say, right? So, uh, so you know, what does that mean even? Like, I, I, I went ahead and you're, uh, you're, you're, you're waiting for the city bus and I go ahead and I go out of my way and I give you a ride, right? And I drop you off to where you're going and then you say to me, tiskeh the mitzvot. I give you a blessing that you should have more opportunities of doing things that get you to go out of your way. Like, how is that like a, a nice thing? Like, I give a guy a donation. He says, I give this kid a mitzvah. You should have more opportunities to do, give more tzedakah. I just give my tzedakah. Why do you want me to give more money away? He wants more already. He wants more already, right? He wants more already. But I'm saying, but I, I'm, I'm saying a little differently. As Jews, we recognize that our actions down here, okay, the positive actions down here have massive ramifications above. Remember in last week's parasha where their malachim are going down and up the ladder, back and forth, back and forth. We spoke about this in the morning, right? Why were they coming from, from down here? Don't malachim come from up there? And the answer is no. That the malachim come from our actions down here. When we do good, we create the malachim. And Yaakov was living in a reality where all of his good, all those malachim that he created, they were the ones going up and down. They're the ones going up and down. Our actions bring the malachim into the world. Our good choices bring this positive energy into the universe around us. Are malachim people? No, malachim are definitely not people. Malachim are messengers. Robin's going to like this. The Midrash says that... Robin... <laughs> Ra yeah, yeah, you are. So I don't think, I know you are. Um, I think that the, the, the Midrash says the Malachim have no legs. The Malachim have one, have one leg because they don't need to walk, right? And they, have, and they have six wings. Six wings, isn't that interesting? It's not what you think it is. It's not like the, uh, not the Christian vision of an angel. 
but then they have one leg. And this is why, by the way, when we pray the silent Amidah, we put our feet together and we stand that way to be domela malach, to, to resemble an angel. So when you're putting your feet together, you know, part of the kavanah is having that one foot. You don't need to travel the world with your legs moving back and forth, back and forth. But with your mind, you could travel the universe without moving anywhere. Like a malach, actually, he has the power of moving himself without his legs. It's a different kind of, a different, different, different force of energy, a different reality. Yeah. Uh, sure. Entropy. Destroyed, correct. Yes. Well, according to that, you're actually not creating energy. You're just, right. the energy is already there. It's already you're already just there. redirecting it. Energy. You're redirecting it. Basically, yeah. what you're saying is that, based on what this, um, this is saying, the source is saying, is that we are basically getting back a way that we created that and we transformed our own energy. We, we, it's redirected through us again. Correct. Our actions are able to redirect what's already there, and hopefully, if they're positive, we bring more positive energy. And God forbid, if they're negative, we bring that negative energy f- forward. So we know the sing, we sing the song Yigdal, Yigdal Elokim. So there's one line in there. It says, Sofe ve'yodea sotrenu, ma'bit v'sotavar b'kadmuto. He knows and anticipates all of our hidden matters, and he sees the end of something at its beginning. Right? If God is all-knowing, right, then um, where do we have, then how do we have choice? So Rambam in Hilchot Teshuvah says, no, this is Maimonides, that the answer to this question is longer than the earth and wider than the seas. <laughs> a human being is not able to understand this issue completely, just as he isn't able to perceive the true nature of God. And so he, the Ramban is saying, Maimonides is saying that philosophically we can't fully understand this question, or the answer actually. It's, too, it's beyond us. And I'm going to try to give you uh, my own way, my own feeble way of understanding the question and the answer. So the question we get, the question is, God knows everything, then if he knows everything, then how do I have choices? Okay? So imagine a programmer, okay? So you have a programmer, and he's making a program, and he's, making, he's programming a video game. And you have a character in the video game that does whatever he does, okay? Now, can I create a program that is making its own choices, random choices? And yeah, you can, it's called, it's called game theory. You can actually, you, it's called game theory, okay? That you can create game theory. Game theory is exactly this, that we could create a mathematical system where there's probability of making all kinds of choices, and then this thing will make its own choices based on random whatever it is. Okay, so God creates us using, let's say, game theory, okay, and um, we are randomly making our own choices. Okay, now, does God know what choice we're going to make? Yes. But who made those choices? If I had 15 choices to make, I executed the choice. I'll give you another example. It's going to be a little creepy, I apologize. Imagine I had a time machine, okay? And we, today is uh, Wednesday, and we go to, and I take this time machine to Friday, okay? And, and I'm sitting there in your room, and I'm watching what you're choosing to wear for Shabbat, okay? And I know you're choosing the black dress, okay? And I come back to today, right? And I know what you're choosing. And then on Friday night, I see you in synagogue, and I see you wearing the black dress, and I'm, I'm smiling inside. Does my knowledge of your choice take away your free will? It doesn't, right? It doesn't. Similarly, God creates a reality where he is outside of time. The reason why we are so frustrated by all this is because we think God's in time, and therefore he is aware of what's happening right here, right now. But God knows the past, the present, and the future all at once. Because he understands every single possible outcome. He sees it from the outside. Imagine right now if this was the world that I created and this was the universe, this table, everything inside the table falls into the uh, laws of the video game that I created. Yeah. But does everything outside follow the same laws? No. Does the programmer follow the rules of the game that he created for the game inside the, in, the, in the computer world? The answer is no. He's outside of that re- reality. And therefore we are in the game, in the matrix of life. And therefore, our reality is different than God's reality. So we get stuck using the same principles that we understand in the game that we live in, this world, and say, well, how does it work for God? But we're making the mistake, and that's what the Rambam is saying. We can't understand what it means to be outside of space and time. 
I can't function outside of space and time. I can only know past, present, and future. And I can't live in any one of the, I could only live in the present. I can't live in the past. I mean, I could, but it'll be really bad, right? And I can't live in the future. That is also very bad. My job is to live in the present. It, by the way, it's only in the present that you can, you can, be, you can you actually have the ability of, of meeting God. Because it's in the present where your choices, where you choose to be good or bad, that will determine your relationship with godliness. It's only here right now, this moment right here. If you're watching it, pause, right? You'll pause this moment right here, right now. It's this time right here, right now, in this space where you are able to choose to be godlike or less godly. And therefore, it's only in the present that we find God. Not in the future and not in the past. Right? It's right here, right now. So Maimonides says we can't fully comprehend it. Look at number 10. We cannot comprehend God's omniscience, that means his all-knowing, since his knowledge is not like ours. It is an entirely different level. Man knows the past and the present, but no man can know in advance something unforeseen that will happen in the future. God, however, knows the future as well. All is foreseen, and his knowledge is on a completely different level, which we cannot understand or fathom. He and his knowledge are one. God lives in a world of complete unity. There is no, like for us, knowledge and information comes in bits. I need to know something, what do I do? I go to Google, I Google it, okay. I have time, I, have to, I go to Google and I search it, right? And then I have to take the information, I have to process it and understand it. That's not one. For God, it's all one. It's, he's one, the source of everything. The wisdom, the knowledge, the past, the pre- it's all one place for him. We don't know what that means. We don't live in that reality. We live in a world of process. Women understand this, I believe, better than men. Men want instant results. I want to see it. I want to touch it. I want to feel it right here, right now. But women, most women by nature, understand something called process. But time needs to pass to be able to absorb things. And that's the reality that we live in. We live in a world of process. Everything is process. Development, time needs to take place. A womb develops a child. Child process of growth, raising the child, getting the child ready for school, getting the child ready for college, for marriage, for work, and so on. It's a process. And therefore, we're part of the process. In the story with, with Leah, it's uncomfortable because we're watching the process, but we, we want to see the results immediately. It's not fair. What do you mean? He, she prayed. She was selfless. She, did the, she made the right choices. She did everything that was true. How could she be punished right then and right, th- right, right then? But there's something much greater that's happening. It's kind of like, I'm not sure if anyone has ever gone farming or planting, if you like plants, right? Any botanists in the group? But you know that in order to plant a, a tree, the way it works is like this. You have to find a good piece of earth that has a lot of nutrients. You have to till the earth, okay? You dig a little hole. You take your seeds. You bury it into the earth, you cover it, right? You pour some water, and then you pray. And wait. And you wait. And you wait. And eventually what happens, if we, were, if we were watching, if we were watching underground, if we had a camera looking at the seed, it would look like to us that the seed is rotting. That the seed is dying. Right? It's, it's breaking itself apart, it's crumbling, and it turns into something else instead. Okay, and what ends up happening is slowly it breaks out of the earth and life begins to emerge from this dark place. Something beautiful and green and life-giving. It's beautiful. I mean, I love plants. Beautiful. Right, it's beautiful. Yeah, people that like plants are very spiritual. Um, um, that doesn't mean that if you don't like plants, you're not spiritual, but it means that if you do like them, you're really spiritual. <laughs> so, so, um, so it's beautiful because it's, there's, a, there's a process of time that needs to take place and requires you to let go. Farmers understood several things. One is that life is a process. You know the second thing all farmers understood? There's no room for procrastination. Why? What happens if you decide not to, uh, to seed the earth? What happens if you decide not to go ahead? You miss a cycle, you know what that means? You're gonna die because there's no food. <laughs> Farmers understood that every moment of time was an opportunity to prepare for something tomorrow. We don't live in that reality anymore. We live in a reality where my pantry is filled with food. I have every, every, every kind of distraction in the world literally at the feet. You're living right now in New York City. You can be busy your whole entire life with, 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 with what's in the streets around you and never once think about anything important about your life. But he'll have a great time doing it. Yeah. <laughs> right? 
But this and these conversations, and this is what this is what I believe Judaism is at its core. It wants you to find meaning in the world around you. It wants you to enjoy what New York City has to happen. Go to the play, go to the opera, find a nice opportunity, go chill, enjoy it, shop, but not at the expense of not asking what it means to be the best version of you. How are you taking responsibility for your actions? How are you exercising your free will? Because you're responsible for what this movie looks like at the end. I can't choose what happens at the end of the story. Right? Because God has a plan. All I can do is pray and hope that I make the right choices along the way and that I keep making the right choices so that I, I, I end up doing whatever it is I'm meant to be doing in this world. But ultimately, I choose how I respond to my circumstances. God aligns it so that the right people meet the right people along the path. Look at it says in number 11, Perkei Avot. Right? We say, All is foreseen, yet free will is given. This is the Tosos Yom Tov. This is how he explains it. So the Tanah, the Mishnah. The Tanah is the rabbi that expressed that teaching. And the, Ram, and the Rambam both teach the following truths. That God foresees the future and that man has free will. In retrospect, the author of the Mishnah should have stated, free will is given and all is foreseen. This would have taught me that man is entrusted with free will and yet nothing is hidden from God, thus enabling the existence of a system of reward and punishment, which is the foundation of the entire Torah. But there is no purpose in stating first all is foreseen. The only reason to state first that God is omniscient is because we already know that the free choice has been given. Rather, certainly the intention of the Tanah is to underscore that the fact that even though God foresees the future, this does not contradict the fact that man possesses free will, since God has entrusted man with this capability. You have the power of building the world or destroying it. You have the power of hurting people around you or healing them. You have the power of choosing to use words that inspire or God forbid words that cause and inflict pain. That's your choice. That's not because my mother had a bad, you know, she swore like a sailor, now I can't control myself. It's not because, oh, I went to a bad school and my teacher really was really whatever. At some point, you have to take responsibility for yourselves. You need to have ownership over your story. You're the narrator of your lives. No one else. Forget about everything that happened before. I can't control what happened. But if you're the narrator and you're choosing what the story looks like, what do you want it to look like? Where are you going with it? Where are you taking it? Free will is the most important idea. Reward and punishment is super important, but it doesn't work without free will. Yes, do you have a predisposition to get angry? Maybe. Do you have a predisposition to be jealous? Maybe. But you choose how you respond. You may have a predisposition to be super calm, which sounds like a really good thing, but it could be a very bad thing. Because when you're super calm, you're passive aggressive. You're super calm, you become lazy. You're super calm. Like there, every midah, any any trait in any extreme, is negative. We want balance. How do we get to balance? You've got to choose it. It requires effort, energy, focus. Right? You need to choose to want to be great. It doesn't happen on its own. Greatness. I don't know anyone who's a professional who's great at what they do because they were born that way. It comes through choices how you use your time, how are you focusing on reaching the goal of wherever it is you're meant to be going. Rabbi Chaim Friedlander, number 12. At the moment a person chooses, God forbid, to do an evil act, God is already fully aware of that decision. At the time that person decides to perform a good deed, God is, it also knows in advance that he made that decision. However, the actual decision-making process of evaluating good and bad alternatives remains the free choice of man. That's what I've been saying. Hakol bidei shemaim chutz mirat shemaim. Right? Everything is in the hand of heavens except for the fear of heaven. Why is that the ultimate choice? The fear of heaven. You see, if you believe that there is no God, then you're just an animal. Right? What is there? They just do whatever you want to do. You, you, you. You're lost. I'm not saying you're lost necessarily, but you're just your your impulses. If there's no God then there's no truth. There's no morality. It's whatever construct we decide to have in, with society, right? We just become our, we're, just, we're higher functioning animals. 
But if you do believe in God, the, the greater the yirah, the greater the awareness, the awe of the Almighty, the more in accord you will be with his wants and desires. The more in accord you will be with morality, which just now, that's not old, always true. Obviously, there's plenty of, of people who think they have your, uh, that present themselves as having, you know, uh, super religious intentions, and that could be super corrupt also, because remember, any extreme for me is bad. It's all about balance, 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 balance. My kids always ask me, Abba, is it true that any extreme is bad? I'm like, yeah, well, what about learning Torah? I'm like, even learning Torah to an extreme is bad. That if, you, if you're learning all day and you, there's no space for you to be you, that's a problem too. If you're so, extremely kind. Also a problem. It's a problem too. Extremely giving charity is also. Yes. Any, because what happens is like this. If you're extremely giving, you're not creating the space for a person to become independent. You're making them dependent. And dependency, we all know, is a bad word. We could create interdependence Right, where we're depending on each other, but there has to be a space for that given back and forth. But if I'm giving you, again, I, I love this, Masha, if I gave you a credit card that had an infinite amount of money on it, would I be giving you a positive thing or a negative thing? Negative. Well, super negative. I'd, I'd be destroying you at that moment. Why? Why would I be destroying you? Everything, right? Oh, hi, Mom. Uh, my keys are in my jacket upstairs. I'm finishing my class in like 10 minutes. On the fourth floor, you have to go, you have to ask Jessica for it. Um, my mother-in-law. No. She's, uh, she's, she's the Ashkenazi one of the family. <laughs> yeah, she's Ashkenazi. No, not everything's possible. My daughter does not look like she's my child either. She's, you know, she's blonde and light and whatever it is. But my, my argument is that as we get older and we have children, we run out of ink, so the kids are lighter. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, so, so, um, so um, everything gets white. You get gray, you get, everything gets lighter. You're running out of ink. So uh, you have a, uh, you have a um, where was I? I call me the Shemaim. So the greater that awareness, okay, the more aligned you are with the mission, the more aligned you are with becoming a moral, you should become more aligned with becoming a moral human being that's looking for justice in the world. That's what's there, but that's your choice. Look at what Rashi says. Rashi says on that, on that, on that, on that idea, everything's in the hands of heaven except for your Shemaim. He says, everything that is placed on a person is decreed by God. For instance, whether the person is tall, short, poor, rich, smart, dull, light, or dark, is all decreed by heaven. But whether a person is righteous or evil is not decreed by heaven, but it is entrusted to the individual's choice. He has two paths in front of him, and he needs to choose to fear heaven. Now, what does that mean? Let's break that down. Okay, can I control the family I'm born into? No. I can't control my parents. I wish I could, but I can't, right? Can I control the community? Can I control the in intelligence, my, my athletic ability? My, 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 my intellectual capacity, I can't control those things. The only thing I can, and that's what he's saying, he's like, that's determined, you can't choose that. You can't choose, you can't choose your body. You're born with what you have, I can't choose my face. Uh, today it's happening with avatars and the metaverse, it's changing a little bit, right? Because we're, we're that narcissistic and think that we can control everything, but really we can't. The question is, how are we gonna respond to the circumstances that we are in? Right? That's all I can choose. How am I going to respond to being in a wealthy family or in a poor family, in a family of intellectuals to a family of, you know, of, of average IQ people? How do I respond to what I have? How do I make the most of my reality? And therefore, he's saying you choose. It's your choice. Choose to be someone who is, when I think of Yirat, yirat Hashem is a very scary word. I don't like it. Um, if it's really, it, it means more than that. It means having awe of God. Yir'ah means awe. What does awe mean? Awe means being like taken in by the splendor, the awesomeness of God. By being like, wow, it's amazing, astonished by <coughs> the brilliance of God. <coughs> That's more motivating to me than Yir'ah. I don't think of Yir'ah as like sitting there afraid of like being hit by God. That, that's not my vision of Yir'ah. That's not what God, <laughs> bless you, that's not what God wants. Yeah. You won't do 
Yeah, that's true also, but I think of it the other way. Remember when Yosef was about to sin with, uh, with uh, Potiphar's wife? Was that year ah as in fear or as awe? Fear. It's not, it's not, it's not fear. It's, no. It's like my dad would be so disappointed in me. He's so amazing. He's so awesome. I can't do that to him. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not the belt. I don't think it's the belt. I think it's something bigger than the belt. I think that there's true, there's something to be said about having that fear also, but I think greater than the fear is Ahava. Love? Yeah. Love. Yeah. Love. yeah. <laughs> this is not my idea, by the way. This idea is brought down by Rav Hirsch. There is actually a massive machloket as to what the word yirah means, and uh, depending on which the nomination of Judaism, your come Hasidic, Litvish, depending on what part of Europe, there's different interpretations. For me, for me as an, as an American, American who was born in Brooklyn, uh, and I was born in Crown Heights, so I have like a little Hasidic in me, I guess. Um, even though I'm not Lubavitch, I'm not Chabad, although I, I love Chabad. Um, it's that the year A means love. It means, it means awe. It's not, it's not about fear. I don't think we get to God by, by, through fear. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah, I don't like that. I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't think that's true. I don't think that... I, I, the way I explain... The only way I could explain... I can't... First of all, I can't. No one can. But, I, uh, but I, if, if you wanted me to try, uh, this is how I'd respond to that. I would say I can't... I don't know if it's a... Let's say it's true that we sinned. Okay? Did the Germans need to um, imprison the, uh, the Jews in the way that they did? Did they need to create gas chambers and concentration camps and extermination camps? Did they need to humiliate them the way they did? And the answer is no. Evil is a reflection of man's choices, not God saying, I'm punishing you in this way, right? Again, had the Germans chosen not to take on that position, had they chose to, to remain true to their own moral principles, which they were so proud of, Right? None of that would have happened. So what ended up happening is that you had a whole nation of people that made horrible choices, and that is the evil of the Holocaust. I don't think it came from me. You could have a crazy person who pulls out a gun and chooses to walk into a street and to shoot people. Right? That's a choice that person made. Now, okay, we'll talk about, you want to get into like a more complicated cases of someone who's deranged, who has mental illness. I'm not talking about that. I don't think you. Agree, I don't think you believe that everyone in the Holocaust had mental illness. That the Germans all had mental. They were all mentally ill. They were super methodical intellectuals that made choices about how they're going to exterminate one group of people. I'm saying uh, the, the people. All we could have done is to choose how we were going to respond to that. That's all we can do. So God is not the picture. I, I I think that God orchestrates things, but I don't. Be, I don't blame God for the evil of the Holocaust. I blame man for the evil of the Holocaust. What's that? Yeah, sure. I've heard it said also by people that say. That's a horrible thing to say because 80% of the people that died in the Holocaust were not Reform. They were Orthodox. Meaning the people that most of the people that died in the Holocaust were the people that were should have been doing what we would imagine did the right thing, right? They were living that life. The majority of the Jews of Europe were not reform. Uh, no, so there were, there were things, there were things that were happening. Again, like that's a very difficult question. But again, so I'm saying if you want to, if you want to know where I would start answering that question, it would be that it, it was, it's, it's an evil that's perpetrated by man, man's choice of bringing evil into the world and not God bringing evil into the world. I think a harder question isn't when, when you see one group of people uh, subjugating another group of people. I think a more difficult thing to, uh, to deal with as far as evil is how do you deal with a tsunami that wipes out like 200,000 people? I think that's much more difficult to, 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 to explain away. Like a natural, a mudslide in India. What's that? We were supposed to ask questions. Yes. But from what I understand, what, 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 what
correct. We don't. We don't. That's, that's what that's what we're saying over here. We don't fully. We don't have the full question. We don't have the full ability to comprehend it. But when it comes to man's actions, at the very least, I could explain. Well, that's an ex- the Germans is a great example of man choosing bad and bringing evil into the world. But when it comes to natural phenomenon, it's hard to say that God wasn't aware of what was happening over there. Now, you could argue that God creates nature and he sets nature up in a way where it's just going to happen. And, you know, you choose to live in an area where there are mudslides and you get, you know, you get wiped out by a mudslide. That's your fault. I don't know. I don't know. Don't live near a volcano and you won't have Pompeii, you know, <laughs> melt away your whole entire community. You can apply the same thing you said about Dina. Yeah. So there's a bigger picture. Yeah, you could. I don't want to phrase it. I'm just saying that's the But in Dina, it's different. might happen. It's, it, with Dina, it's a little different. And in the Holocaust, it's different. Because remember, in both cases, there are people making choices. Right. So like Shechem chooses to rape Dina. Leah makes a choice to change the child. These are choices that we people are making. When it comes to natural phenomenon... Natural phenomenon. But the children making a decision to do what they did, that's another choice. Correct. You're right, yeah. But what about in Israel? But that is an expression of man's free will. Do you know what I'm saying? If Israel, if there was, I'll put it like this, if there was a massive earthquake tomorrow yeah. that killed a million people in some country, right? It's hard to say that, that we, a lot of death, a lot of pain over there, right? That's the question. Like, how do we explain and understand that? That's an act of God, right? But that's like a whole other question that I'm not even trying to deal with right now because that requires a lot more fine-tuning and understanding God's plan and will and so on and so forth. But that's a harder question, I think. A more difficult question to answer than the Holocaust, for me at least. So as a people, it's not a free will. So you think it's really individual. We don't really necessarily function as a people. Like, for example, we do Jew are really bad Jews. You have to pay the price for the really bad Jew. No. This tends to be a huge But that's, again, that's, you're, you're talking about anti-Semitism, which is an expression of people's poor choices. No, I mean, within a Jewish group. Yeah, within a Jewish group. So like, you're, we're right now living in New York, and some guy decides tomorrow to walk into a mosque, God forbid, and blow yes, it up. Yes. And then tomorrow, all the Jews in New York City become targets of like, you know, like Muslim haters and whatever it is, right? And it becomes a horrible bloodbath in the streets. Why should I pay for that one person's choice? But yeah, we've, we say, call Yisrael a raven zelazeh. We're all interconnected. There is this interconnectivity. My actions, your actions are all interrelated. It's true, right? But ultimately, we're talking about, you know, for this conversation, we're not talking about the bigger picture. That's the macro. Right now, we're looking at the micro. My choices. My choices impact me. How many stories of, in the Holocaust of people who made the right choices, of Germans who saved the Jews, of Jews who ended up you know, being noble and steadfast and did the right thing, and the, the right results, versus Jews who made the right choices and bad things happened, or Germans who made the, made the right choices and they were punished and killed for it. There is justice in the system. We don't fully understand how, it, how, it, how it's played out. Okay, I want to do a little bit more, and I think the rest of you guys could do for homework. Okay. Um, where, where are we? Number 14, uh, number 15. Chovot Okay, and we're on page number 4, number 15. Even when you're fully aware that the effort is worthless without the decree of a creator, nevertheless, a landowner must plow his land, cleared, uh, cleared of his thorns, planted and irrigated uh, um, if he has water, and trust the creator will make it fruitful, protect it from mishaps, increase its yield, and bless it. But it is inappropriate to abandon the field and not work at the cultivating it, but simply put trust in God's decree to cause the earth to yield crops without being planted. Similarly, a craftsman, merchants, and hired workers are commanded to seek their livelihood while maintaining their trust in God. For man's sustenance is under his control, and he, and, and he guarantees it to man and provides it through whatever means it may be. A person should not think that his means of earning a living can help him or harm him in any way. We saw this 